topic today is dissolving the wall of shame. I am Richard Lee. I'm director of Sound Vitality and in charge of research and development here. And uh, today I'm, we're going to discuss how shame creates illness. It's kind of an odd concept. We don't connect shame to physical illnesses. We think of shame as kind of a behavioral thing. You, you say that was bad and somebody crumples up and uh, hopefully doesn't do it again. That's kind of where shame goes mostly. But we discover that shame has a big impact on our health and on how separate we are from all sorts of things in life, which is quite interesting. And we're going to learn uh, different pathways to dissolving shame because this is really important to health and happiness and life in general. Okay, how I got involved in it in the first place was I was working with Lisa who had some issues. She just wasn't happy. And we talked about her in the last webinar, so you can watch that one to learn more about her. And we're going to put the, the write-up of her on this webinar on the downloads part, so you can download it later on. Uh, Lisa was exploring and attempting to get in touch with what was holding her back. She had experienced periods of like her light was shining, like she had gotten her power back and light was her light was shining, and then periods of closing down. And so what we did was we applied the scaling light to the space around her to help clear out all the mental congestion that was around her that was keeping her from seeing. And when we did that, she looked and sort of looked inside of herself to see what it was that was holding her back. And she said, I see a big brick wall. And so in the, you'll, you'll read in that that we explored for a while, what is the nature of that big brick wall and uh, what's on the other side. And as you see in this picture, what is it about us that makes it difficult to see the brick wall? or the, the wall, whether it's uh, bricks, rocks, logs, or trees, whatever it's made of. Okay, so, so why do I associate the brick wall to shame? Uh, Dr. David Hawkins, MD, you may have heard of him. He wrote Power Versus Force and some other books. And basically, he offers a levels of consciousness. And so he, we use calibration, basically applied kinesiology, to calibrate levels, all sorts of things, but levels of consciousness. So there is optimism, love, uh, reason, joy, enlightenment states. And at the very low end, there's guilt, denial. Uh, guilt, he rated at 30, which is pretty low, and denial at 25, shame at 20, and despair at 20. And this means these are the bottom of the bucket, some of the worst consciousness states you can be in. And I looked at that, and there's something that I didn't like about it. Shame and despair both rated 20, the same number. How can shame and despair be the same? So I thought about it a lot. I realized despair, pretty much God has abandoned me. The world around me is not supporting me. And shame is I don't deserve to face God. Very different. Two very different uh, states of consciousness. Both are fairly difficult to treat. Despair, though, is easier. With despair, oh, basically we suffer from withdrawal and kind of withering away. And if there is hope, we begin to come out of it. And very often, just the, the counselor, somebody to talk to, somebody who gives us the idea that there's something worth living about, there is connection, even this person who we're talking to does care about us, and so the whole universe hasn't given up on us. It's a little easier to get out of despair. 
But shame, it, instead of withdrawal, it's more like hiding, hiding ourselves and some self-hatred. And instead of hope lying behind it, self-sabotage lies behind it. People often in shame will often go to drugs to numb their awareness or their judgment of themselves. They'll create a lot of conflict so that they see that the problems in the outside world and not in this discomfort they're feeling, this judge self-judgment they're feeling inside of them. And there's a constant nagging voice. You screwed up again. You don't deserve. It was very interesting as Lisa, as we were discussing, and Lisa was facing this wall and attempting to pass through the wall, this voice started talking to her. And she started telling me what the voice was saying. And it was things like, you're never going to make it. There's no point to trying. There's nothing on the other side of the wall. And all this sort of stuff. And it was very interesting. What, what is that voice? Why does it seem to be helpful? But why is it so negative? And so that's really what got me on this path to associating the brick wall with shame. Now, what happened in the Garden of Eden? This is a little change of topic, but it's the same topic because perhaps the story of gar the Garden of Eden and the apple of knowledge is a story of the origin of shame. Adam ate the apple of knowledge. Adam and Eve, I guess, ate the apple of knowledge. And eating the apple created shame. It didn't just create knowledge. It created awareness that we are shameful beings. It created self-judgment. And when they ate the apple, they felt like they no longer deserved to associate with the Creator. It's as if they had done something really, really bad, and they never, never again ever deserved to have the relationship with the Creator they had before. And this we see with shame. People who do something that they feel is really bad, they don't deserve to have friends again. They don't deserve for family or anybody else to even associate with them anymore, and they shrink up. Uh, the Garden of Eden story is one story of the origin of shame. There are other stories as well. And I, I like a different one. Well, well, first off, let's look at what is shame. The German Blitzkrieg uh, during World War II terrified people. And the atom bomb uh, that Americans dropped on Japan also terrified people. They were faced with death, with physical annihilation. And they gave up. They said, okay, no, we give up. And shame is similar. It threatens our emotional being. Oh, we, we can be rejected by a group. We can be abandoned by parents. We can be excommunicated by the clan, by the church, by all kinds of, by the, the high school clique that throws us out. We can be thrown out by all sorts of things, and we can be humili humiliated. And this all adds up to emotional annihilation. Just like in our modern world, we get threatened with death, or we threaten other people with death, and then they give up. This emotional annihilation is something that is extremely effective at getting people to crumple up and give up. Okay, what is the source of shame? We looked at the Garden of Eden. My favorite story is, back in the times, rather than having the physical consciousness that we do now, we were more dominated by an emotional consciousness. And so there was a great deal more understanding of the emotional nature of things. Could, conceivably, gather up a bunch of self-loathing, self-condemnation, just like the wizard in Harry Potter, the, the lead wizard there, he would take his, his wand and pull memories out of a person. Well, imagine if you could pull shameful self-judgment, self-loathing, self-condemnation 
out of all of the people of your clan and then put it into an apple or put it into a ball of energy and then you throw it at your enemy or perhaps you give them a basket of apples that are filled with this emotional stuff like a, like a virus. It's this, this virus that can get into them. There's another source. So they programmed humans to be obedient. And one of the ways that you can program humans to be obedient, as we know, is fill them full of shame. You can take somebody and tell them they're wrong, they're awful, praise them some of the time and condemn them some of the time, and it's brainwashing, and you can control them. And then there's the more common theory that our ancestors were shamed over and over again, and it got into their instinctual nature. And so by natural protection, if somebody really threatens us and tells us that we are bad, we really back off, study what it was that we did, and shrivel up into a ball. And finally, the most, if you don't like any of these other explanations, perhaps you'll like this one, that is training of children. Perhaps when you were four years old, you spilled your milk and your mother or father just got all upset. Just, you're not even going to be able to eat at the dinner table anymore if you spill your milk. This was awful. This was terrible. Don't ever, ever do that again. Or perhaps you were two months old and you basically pooped outside your diaper and oh, it went ballistic and you stored that all inside of you. So these are other stories of the source of shame. Shame is there and it's very important. Okay, so my perspective is that shame is a dark astral or emotional substance of separation. Basically, when shame is in me, I feel like I, I don't deserve to be a part of the group. I don't deserve to be cared for. I don't deserve any of this stuff. Simply, I don't deserve. I deserve to be separate, isolated, all this sort of stuff. Now, here's, here's a model of the substance of shame that we talked about just now. We have a spiritual nature that is, you know, each of us in our hearts has a spiritual nature that we're often encouraged to go inward and look for. And we have a conscious nature. What are we aware of? What do we uh, see, experience? You know, what are our emotional experiences? Then we have an unconscious nature programmed into ourselves that come from our ancestors, from our parents, from our early childhood. And out of this unconscious nature is where I am a failure. I did wrong. I deserve punishment comes from. And this all, as we observe all this judgment, it becomes clear. I don't deserve. That's a key phrase. I don't deserve. Because that's a huge limiting belief. Okay, back to the wall. What is the wall made of now? Uh, let's look at the bricks themselves. Unconscious uh, from the cellular memory, compulsion towards separation self-attack, self-deprivation, I don't deserve, and uh, setting up failure, call it self-sabotage. Uh, all of these are characteristics of shame. And then what keeps us, what is this cloud that keeps us from experiencing the shame? Basically, what is the mortar made of, the stuff that holds this wall together to make it invisible? or us unable to perceive what's in the bricks themselves. First off, there's mental chatter. A bunch of people, most of us, have very busy minds. We think and think and we worry and we have all this cloud of thoughts, worries, judgments, and things around us, just like Lisa did when she could not see into the wall. And when we cleared it out with a scaling light, she could begin to see and start moving through the wall and discover what it, what was there inside of her. Depression is a residual of mental chatter. When people say, oh, life is miserable, life is, life is awful, life is hopeless, they develop a cloud around them that prevents them from seeing anything. So it's a real dense cloud. Stress, 
chaos. A lot of people, our lives are filled with emotional turmoil. They're just, they're so busy. They don't have time to even see themselves doing self-attack, uh, separating themselves, self-sabotage. Physical pain. Physical pain is another distraction from seeing shame. If I'm in pain, I'm too busy being in pain. And it often it almost justifies ignoring what the bricks are made of. And then escape. Obviously, conflict. If we start arguments all the time with other people, we're too busy arguing and blaming other people for the discomfort in the world that we don't get around to looking at what are the bricks made of. What are we doing to ourselves? And psychoactives. Shame is probably a leading cause of alcoholism. I discovered that uh, Lisa found that marijuana caused her to get cloudy very quickly. Basically, all of the mortar would get very strong and she wouldn't be able to see anything in this area. She wouldn't be able to see that there is shame that's driving her. So basically, marijuana and other psychoactives, the reason we do them is to numb ourselves out, to make us unaware of the shame, the self-judgment that we feel. What happened when we ate the apple? This is kind of the mechanism of shame within the cells. Okay, imagine that this apple has, has been filled with virus, a virus of self-judgment, self-condemnation, of I don't deserve. It's just packed full of this virus. And when you bite the apple, this virus goes through you. It infects every cell. Every cell is permeated with this dark substance of separation, self-loathing, self-attacking. Shame is contagious. You get people who are feeling ashamed and they become attacking and they so so you can propagate the whole thing people who are have a lot of shame cause other people to have a lot of shame so shame is contagious in addition shame is reproduced when cells divide shame is reproduced with childbirth and shame is of course amplified with shaming you condemn somebody you judge somebody and if they've got a lot of self-judgment in them already, a lot of shame in them, it will suddenly get really big and take over their lives. And here's a, a debatable statement. Shame caused separation. I'm proposing that perhaps we wouldn't have such separation from each other, from one religion, from another religion, one culture, from another culture, separation from the Creator in whatever way we perceive Him. Or her. I'm proposing that shame is the cause of separation. Okay, what is separation then? Classically, we have left brain, right brain. The two brains have whole different ways of doing things. The mind and the heart. The mind thinks and rationalizes. The heart knows and is very accepting. The two are very different sides of the coin, ways to live life and they become separated. There's a vagus nerve, 10th cranial nerve, that connects the mind and the heart, and it becomes traumatized so that we live in one or the other. They're not blended. We have physical medicine, which very much is oriented toward taking things apart and fixing them, fixing things one at a time, or removing them and throwing them away. And the other side is spirit-based medicine, shamanic medicine, energy medicine, this sort of thing. It's very oriented toward looking at the whole person and having everything integrate together. So the physical medicine tends to be a separative medicine. And then we have a very interesting and important one, which is the two sides of the sympathetic nervous system. It runs along both sides of the body. One side, the right side, has liver, gallbladder, and tends to fight. The left side has spleen, pancreas, stomach, the assimilative organs that assimilate sugars and uh, sweetness and that sort of thing. And there we want to make deals with somebody else in order that they will take care of us. Marriage is very often a 
a sympathetic relationship where two people agree to take care of each other. As religions and all kinds of social groups, people come in, agree with each other, and take care of each other. Okay, now for at the cellular level, what does this mean? Fight to survive and take what you need. The, the inflammation response. Be one with the group and give what you have. That's impediment slowing down of healing. There are two separate ways to deal with adversity. Do we fight for control or do we trust? Do we give up our vitality, our energy for somebody else, for the group to decide how best to, to heal us? Okay, we get for, from the fight aspect, we get inflammation and autoimmune disease. Uh, both are, um, autoimmune disease particularly is self-attack, self-loathing, the whole uh, shame thing. It's easy to see how similar shame is to autoimmune disease. So it can be the cellular equivalent to shame. I deserve to be punished. And then on the other side, with the sympathetic relationship, we get impeded healing. An injury will just stop healing, even though it's normal for a bone to bone fracture to heal in a month. Often we get non-union fractures, which just don't heal, and all sorts of other things that turn into chronic illness. That, I'm proposing here, can be caused by shame. The crumpling up, being told, you are wrong, and then going, oh, oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, crumple up into an, a ball and never recover. And so this is turned into impeded healing and chronic illness. Okay, now a very interesting one, cancer. Some cells go on the fight mode. I need to take control, and so we get these rapidly growing cancer cells. And the rest of the body says, oh, I, I'm into oneness. Here, take all of my energy, all of my resources, and I trust that all is going to be good. And that doesn't work well. And we get very rapidly growing cancer in the rest of the body, the person getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Only by uniting the left side and the right side can cancer resolve, can all of these things resolve. Okay, so what we have in, in a very interesting result from this line of thinking, shame is a virus, an emotional substance that infects humanity. Uh, it's contagious. The, this is a very important slide in the whole thing. Everything before it leads up to this. Basically, we're proposing a very different cause of illness, pain, and suffering than is commonly thought in medicine. We're saying that shame, shame is a virus, or rather an emotional contagious stuff that infects humanity, that it, it can cause inflammation, it can cause degeneration, it can cause all sorts of physical things, in addition to causing all sorts of emotional suffering, separation, contributing to alcoholism and other forms of escape from self-loathing, and the second one, the Nessar, which we talked about last week, very low frequency electrostatic stimulator, acts, for, from what I found in, in research, acts as a vibrational antibiotic against shame. It basically shakes up unconscious reactivity at the cellular level, and shame appears to be stored at that level, and can be removed in that way or rather made plastic, which means made changeable. So any programming that's in our cells becomes more able to be changed into something else, which leads to number three, the effectiveness of the Nessar and of every medical intervention that can be applied can probably be tripled with affirmations. To the extent that you're shaking up somebody's cells, w whether it's heart surgery or antibiotics or anything else, saying appropriate affirmations as if you believe them is probably going to greatly increase the effectiveness of the medical procedure. So that's potentially huge, and of course it undermines the impression of the value of the procedure. If we can get a, a medical procedure to work two or three times better by saying affirmations, 
before and after it is applied, we're going to give a lot of credit to the affirmations and less credit to the procedure. So the powers that be want us to believe that only the procedure is what did it. I suggest that you keep in mind when you're with people in hospitals, when you're with people who are ill or suffering or any other way, affirmations. But it's necessary to shake up the unconscious memory, the unconscious reactivity. Uh, how to attenuate shame, how to dissolve shame. First off, it's important to realize that there is no blame. We're in a society that blames, 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 always finding fault. There's always somebody who caused the car accident and somebody who was the victim of the car accident. There's that illusion. We've got to blame somebody. Actually, shame is an illusion. I've got a good story here. I went into the San Clemente planning department because planning personnel were undermining my project. I was trying to redesign an old building and bring it up to being a, something that the city could be proud of. And they didn't want it. And so they undermined me in a variety of ways. And so I complained to them and I was at the, a meeting. And the head of the planning department said, Richard, this is all your fault. You caused this. You did this. And I was like, uh, uh, I didn't. I knew I didn't. I knew that it was nonsense. And yet I couldn't speak. I couldn't talk. Um, I, was, I, I was stuck. And it's like the whole conversation turned at that point and my argument was ignored. My shame that lived inside of me prevented me from standing up for myself. I realized after that meeting, just an illusion inside of me. There's no reason to crumple up like a ball just because somebody else says that I did something bad. That's nonsense. Okay, so at the emotional level, we can calm the emotional body. A turbulence keeps us from seeing the shame, seeing what it is. Uh, releasing limiting attachments, like I don't deserve, is very important. And then, we talked about already, dissolving the shame at the cellular level. Now, here's a very, at the mental level, this is a very important question. Are you responsible for shame? Uh, we see uh, a standard theme in movies where we see some disaster happen. We did something. We said something and to somebody, and they got all upset and ran outside and got hit by a car. We blame ourselves because we have all this shame in us that is telling us all the time, whispering to us, you're going to do it wrong. You're going to make a mistake. Every, you know, everything's going to be a disaster. And then something happens, like we happen to say something that upsets somebody, and then they have some kind of a problem, and we blame ourselves, we punish ourselves, we basically increase the level of self-loathing and self... This is a pattern that's thousands of years old. Are we responsible? This is a, this is a really important question to consider. People are saying things that upset other people all the time. And just because somebody else happens to get into some kind of accident after we say something to them, we can kick ourselves for the rest of our lives. And that's what the movies are about. People who kick themselves for years until they finally relax and forgive themselves. It's just silly. Okay, so dissolving mental congestion. What I did with Lisa was apply the scaling light so that all of that mental busyness, judgment, and all that kind of stuff was temporarily gone. And then she started looking to see what is it that's her real barrier. That's when she saw the wall and was able to start working through the wall, was able to clearly hear this voice, this condemning, negative, judgmental voice that was saying, you're never going to get there. It's hopeless. Don't even try. Give up. It, it's nonsense. You're, you're just making a fool of yourself. Saying all these things, she was able to hear it clearly. 
And so the scaling light's a very valuable tool to provide the mental clarity to be able to perceive. And then a good affirmation. I make the best decisions I can given my limited knowledge and unconscious programming. No matter what happens, I know I did the best I could and I do not judge myself for the result. This is a very strong statement for it says that I know I have issues. I know I have unconscious programming. I know that I have the tendency to say passive aggressive things, critical things that I don't mean. I have the habit of doing all these things my grandparents had it. It lives in my cells. It comes out sometime. And that's a given of living in this physical body. And also, I think through choices. I can do this or I can do this. I need to make a choice. I choose this. If it happens that this time that I chose this, some kind of a disaster arises, and another time I did this and something really good happens, do I pat myself on the back for the thing that happened that was really good? And do I kick myself forever for the thing that happened that was really bad? Or do I, in both cases, say, I made the best decision that I could? Yeah, that's, that's pretty clear. That's the truth. And then what happens from there, I don't have control over. And then here's the last line. This has always been true, which means that in the past, every time I have done something, every choice I've made, everything that I've done that's turned good and turned to disaster has been a situation just like this one, where I, I thought about it, considered it, had my unconscious reactivity, maybe had a bad day, somebody yelled at me, so I yelled a little more than I should. and. It's always been true that I made the best decision I could, and then whatever happened from there happened. This is a very important thing to see. Okay. On the emotional level, calming the emotional body, this is very important for applying the infratonic nine to the thymus or wherever you feel pain or inflammation, and saying an affirmation. My cells cooperate joyfully to bring accelerated healing and abundant health and vitality to my life. Or something that is saying everything is coming together in harmony and peace. So applying uh, inflammation and to uh, turbulence will calm you down. Applying it and saying an affirmation will do twice as well. Okay, now releasing limiting attachments. I, I did a, another video that's on YouTube about this, how to use the infratonic S. Now we're going to rename that the liberator. Uh, applying it across the diaphragm and breathing out congestion, limiting beliefs. This can be very good for breathing out, I don't deserve, I deserve to be punished, all of these sorts of things that go and shape our lives. We shape our lives through these expectations, these unconscious things stored in ourselves, like I don't deserve. And the, the infratonic S and this method is extremely valuable to release these unconscious attachments, these limiting beliefs. Okay, let's take a little a side note here. How is unconscious shame used. It's important for us to consider when we're feeling shame, what is the other person's intention? Our parents, who are probably to a large extent responsible for the shame that we feel, wanted to teach us. They wanted to help us to be better people. They wanted to help us to see where we can improve. And of course, you don't show people where they can improve by talking about what they're doing well. You say, you could have done that better. And if they have some baggage with them, they, they say, you screwed up again. And another approach is behavioral conditioning. They might say, 
Every time you start to do something that's a negative behavior, they might say, stop that. No, stop that. And that's a behavioral con conditioning process that is training us, just like you can train laboratory mice, not to do things. It also can create this shame. And then there's the control. There are people who, like that director of planning, who wanted to control the situation and wanted to control me, and he came up with a, a lie, said it boldly and loudly, an attack, and I shriveled up. So that was a control issue. And then uh, manipulation as well. There are all kinds of ways to undermine people through, by shaming them so that you can then control them or control the situation. Okay, a key strategy to dealing with this is first choose to dissolve the shame. I choose to see shame clearly and I choose not to be a victim of shame anymore. And as I see it clearly and do not react to it, I don't crumple up and become shamed. I merely see it and observe it and experience it. It will dissolve. And this is a choice. I choose to dissolve shame within me. And then the other strategy, observe reaction to criticism. When somebody criticizes me, makes a passive aggressive remark or a specific attack remark or whatever it is, how do I respond? How do I react? Do I have shame in me? The, usually the other person has absolutely no basis for saying it or else they have a teeny tiny basis for saying it. But still, for me to respond with shame is unnecessary and inappropriate. So observing our reaction to criticism is very valuable. And finally, if you have in your life, or if anybody has in their lives, somebody who likes to criticize, shame, somebody who makes passive aggressive remarks, they're probably not friends, or they're not helping you to overcome your shame. On the other hand, if you are truly conscious, if you choose to be conscious while you're around them, and you observe that they are making these statements and you observe how you feel inside when they make them and you choose, I'm not going to crumple up. They can be great teachers for you. Okay, dissolving cellular shame. Okay, for this, you can look at our last, uh, from two weeks ago, the webinar where we talked about dissolving unconscious reactivity and post-traumatic stress disorder is mostly what we focused on there. But shame is approached in exactly the same way. Apply the Nesser, say selected affirmations, repeat the process for two days while your cells, this unconscious reactivities in your cells is still plastic. And there's no need to repeat it uh, more than once a week and usually three, two to five weeks, two to five treatments is plenty. Okay. Oh, we have made it. This is our, our summary slide. You can find our videos at uh, youtube.com Sound Vitality. We'll get them up as soon as we get them ready. And we're, we're making progress on that. For sales and customer support, you can talk with Mina. And for uh, web webinar feedback or other things, contact Karina. And so now I'd like to open it up to questions. Let's see. I just un uh, unmuted the microphones. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Just click on your microphone so it turns green and ask a question. Yes. Thanks so much for that wonderful uh, and interesting training. I'm Margaret, and I just would like to know about the ancestral transference. Uh, from the womb of mothers, are they capable of transferring shame into their uh, children prior to them being born? Okay. If you look at your behavior, your unconscious habits and your behaviors, you can usually see that you do those things that your ancestors did. Your grandparents, you find yourself doing things in ways that are all the ways they always did things. 
I like to tell the story of the family that adopted two children when they were just one month old, one from Romania and one from Korea. The Romanian child insisted on eating bread and the Korean child insisted on eating rice. These habits, these instinctual patterns are carried with them. And so it, it makes total sense that shame is one of those things that just comes with people through birth, passed from parents to children. And it's very important then to clear shame from the parents before they have kids because it's so much easier and this world will rapidly become a calmer, easier, more optimistic place. Any comments? Hi, I have a question. Uh, this is Cynthia. Do Cynthia, you... welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a son who has Asperger's and I'm trying to work with him with his anxiety and depression. And if you have information that you can pass on with this generational healing, as well as um, self-deprivation that he seems to spiral into uh, in his meltdowns. Is there anything that you can give me as far as how uh, the, the brick wall can be brought down without him withdrawing? I would have to give that some thought. I don't have any answer right off the top of my head. It's a good question. It's a challenge. Okay, thank you. Or you can email me an answer. You can uh, give us a call and we can work that way. That's probably better. Okay, any other questions at this point? Okay, Maria, yes, please. Yeah? Okay, well, that sounds uh, like uh, another, it could be considered another version of shame. I, uh, through my studies, I have grown and I can now see the light, I can perceive the light, but from my uh, analytical attachments, I see the light, but I don't, I don't allow myself to fully step into the light. My thought is that it is possible to let go of that restriction and step fully into the light. We'll have to practice with that and see, see whether we get there. So um, I don't have a, a good solid way forward except to try and we'll see what happens. Okay, yes. Ah, um, oh, the, the, you see clearly. You can see clearly, so you don't need the scaling light. Uh, you're, you're, you're seeing where you are. You're seeing the light. You're, you're holding yourself back. And it seems like you're pretty conscious of your emotional states, your limiting beliefs. I, I would say the Nesser with the appropriate affirmations would be a very good way to try. You're welcome. And for those who don't know, that was Dr. Maria Gonzalez, our senior scientist here. Thank you for that question and all the help that you provided to us. Okay, I, uh, we will say goodbye now. And thank you all for attending. <laughs>